Okay. <laughs> ready to go whenever you are, Ron. All right. Um, I'm ready. So how does this work? Um, okay, Brad, it says it's recording, so All right. I, I had paused the recording. So are you taking care of the recording now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Your volume's not very loud either, Brad. Oh, I'll speak up when I'm actually talking. Okay, okay thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the Law Club. We'll go ahead and get underway for our part of the program. Uh, this is Ron Wachikowski, and I am speaking to you from um, Kiowa Island, South Carolina, where my family is having a family vacation. Taking a few minutes out to chat with you. Um, you, you just saw the presentation by Justice Frank Sullivan, who did a superb job, as usual. He ended the program talking about a case um, which is very familiar to me, as he mentioned. He showed a photo. I, I remember that photo distinctly because it comprised about a half of a cover page on the Indiana lawyer with the headline, Supreme Disappointment. And so I'm well reminded of, uh, of that decision and I won't go back into it, but it was probably the most devastating loss of my legal career. Which brings me back to uh, his tribute and recognition of our president, former president, uh, John Baker. I want to join in that tribute. I, I have had the privilege of trying a number of cases in Judge Baker's court when he was a, on the Superior Court in Monroe County. I've had the privilege of arguing in his court a number of times uh, over the years and obviously the privilege of uh, working with him in the law club. He has uh, made an enormous uh, contribution to justice in Indiana during the course of that career. And uh, I just wanted to join Justice Sullivan in wishing him the best on behalf of, uh, of the club and myself. So with that out of the way, let me turn to um, our program. We've, we've sent out a handout earlier today. I hope most of you have that available. Um, our plan is as, uh, as typically, Brad and I are gonna be talking about recent cases of interest to Indiana lawyers. And as usual, I start with one item in the news that I thought was interesting. And you might see if you've got the handout in front of you, the, uh, the photograph of a poodle under the headline, awards are great marketing tools, but they're not all created equal. And uh, in the story, it talks about this poodle named Lucy Davis who um, uh, was nominated for a membership in an organization called Lawyers of Distinction. And her, um, of the, the owner's law firm paid $475 for her membership and uh, identified her as being a, um, a, a, having received a Juris Doctor degree, spelled D-O-G, and a member of the King County Bark Association. And the application was quickly accepted, the check cashed, and then the plaque received for her being named one of the top 10% of attorneys in the country. The article talks about the uh, proliferation of bogus awards in our profession over the last several years. I won't go into that except to say that if you are tempted by these pay to play folks, I thought you might want to know that a poodle was a fellow member, at least of this Lawyers of Distinction group. With that, let's move on to the serious work of the day. I want to start with a criminal case. Uh, Justice Sullivan correctly mentioned that we don't often talk about criminal cases in our presentations, but this is one that, uh, by the way, is everybody seeing me or is everybody watching Brad? Not sure, may depend on. We see you, Ron. Okay. If we go to active, you have to go to active speaker view, but we see you. Okay, all right, all right. I, I, was, I was watching watching Brad as I was talking. All right, so, so the first case I wanna talk about is, as I said, a case coming out of the uh, Indiana Supreme Court uh, that deals with criminal issues and specifically deals with the question of whether you can be compelled to tell the police the passcode of your 
smartphone. Um, it's an, a, a decision authored by Chief Justice Loretta Rush in the case of Sayo versus State of Indiana. And the issue arose in Hamilton County after Caitlin Sayo called the Sheriff's Department and accused an acquaintance of rape. The suspect denied the rape and accused Sayo of stalking and harassing her. And he said he had been receiving up to 30 calls or text messages a day, which he thought were coming from her. The sheriff's detective began investigating and tried to compel Sayo to unlock her phone so he could search for evidence of the harassment. He thought Sayo had placed these calls using an app or an internet program to disguise her phone number. He got a search warrant from Judge Nation in Hamilton County that, and, and an order from Judge Nation ordering Sayo to unlock the phone and said she would be subject to the contempt power of the court if she refused. Well, she refused. And she argued that unlocking her phone would violate her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Judge Nation nonetheless held her in contempt but stayed it pending appeal. So the issue uh, in terms of whether the Fifth Amendment uh, precludes uh, this search of her phone and forcing her to identify her passcode uh, was first went to the Court of Appeals, they reversed. And the Supreme Court granted transfer and in this opinion addresses what is the court, I think, believes to be a very important decision for a lot of folks because of the significance of smartphones. The court mentions that smartphones are everywhere and contain everything. In particular, um, Judge Justice Rush wrote, smartphones could just as easily be called cameras, video players, Rolodexes, calendars, tape recorders, libraries, diaries, albums, televisions, maps, or newspapers and they can contain in digital form the combined footprint of what has been occurring socially, economically, personally, psychologically, spiritually, and sometimes even sexually in the owner's life. So compelling the unlocking or production of the contents of a smartphone has enormous implications, the court was observing. And in assessing it, first look to the reality that the Fifth Amendment only protects communications that are testimonial in a nature and is unlocking a smartphone or giving the passcode of a smartphone a testimonial communication. The court looks at that and says, well, giving law enforcement an unlocked smartphone communicates to the state at a minimum that one, the suspect knows the password, two, the files on the device exist, and three, the suspect files. That is uh, sufficient from the Supreme Court's perspective, or at least the majority, to make it a communication that is testimonial in nature and therefore protected uh, um, against uh, self-incrimination by the Fifth Amendment. So the question then becomes, is there an exception that might apply? And, and there's one exception the court has recognized, the Supreme Court has recognized, called the foregone, foregone conclusion exception. And that exception was recognized in, in relation to tax documents that the suspect has filed. If you seek to search or obtain the tax documents from a party, the fact that that person has filed them with the government and the government has them makes it kind of a foregone conclusion as to whether the, the suspect uh, they exist and the suspect possessed those files at some point in time. So this was different, the court said. Unlocking a smartphone communicates information, but it, you, you, the foregone conclusion exception simply doesn't fit here. Uh, particularly in this case where they were searching specifically for information that nobody else had at that point in time in the government. And more generally, the court talks about well, we're not going to apply the foregone conclusion exception in this case. Is it available in other cases? The court didn't foreclose it, but suggested that was highly unlikely, suggesting that, it, that this narrow exception may be generally unsuitable to the compelled production of any unlocked smartphone. And it may, in fact, be un unworkable in the smartphone context. 
there were two dissents in the case. Both Justices Massa and Slaughter wrote dissents. Um, both of them argued that the case was moot because while the case was on appeal, um, Ms. Sayo uh, entered a plea agreement in which she had pled guilty to one uh, count and 18 other counts were dismissed. Um, but the issue of whether she might suffer from the contempt findings seems to have been still up in the air because that was not, was not clear that that was finally resolved. And in the majority opinion, uh, Chief Justice Rush notes that the investigators were thinking that there might be additional crimes that they might be able to pursue if they were able to obtain the, uh, the access to the cell phone. So the court said it wasn't, the majority said it wasn't moot, uh, although Justices Massa and Slaughter uh, dissented on that point. But what you have is a, a clear decision by the Indiana Supreme Court that the Fifth Amendment's protection against self-incrimination precludes compelling a person to provide the passcode to his or her smartphone in the absence of something that's going to fit this foregone conclusion exception. And this court doesn't seem to think that that's likely to occur. So uh, that I think is, is a very significant decision that, uh, that may come into play in a lot of different ways in coming years. And we may obviously have a decision from the US Supreme Court on that issue as well. Apparently, it's a much litigated issue around the country. Uh, our next case is one that involves um, a motion to dismiss that is supported by exhibits. And the, and the trial court concludes it's gonna be treated as a summary judgment, but then, as the Court of Appeals holds, uh, doesn't really treat it like a motion for summary judgment. Um, the case is the 487 Broadway Company LLC versus Robinson and an opinion by Judge Najum. And it arose in this concept, context. The, the 487 Broadway Company agreed to buy a building from Calumet Township, um, but before closing, the township removed some lighted signs, pictures, and artifacts. And in doing so, they caused some damage to the building. And 487 sued Calumet Township for negligence and breach of contract. Uh, the township moved to dismiss and supported the, the motion with several unauthenticated exhibits. The trial court seeing the motion to dismiss with the exhibits simply uh, responded informing the parties it would treat the motion as one for summary judgment and then gave 487 Broadway 20 days to reply. Oh, yeah. For summary judgment, it's 30 days. Um, and there were other problems as well, but the court, um, well, the, the 487 Broadway responded by seeking a stay, saying it wanted to do discovery. The court denied the stay, granted the motion for summary judgment, and then 487 Broadway appeal. And in reviewing this on appeal, Judge Nation uh, Najum basically concluded that virtually everything done in the trial court was wrong. First, by not giving 30 days to reply, which is what's required by Rule 56. Secondly, by not allowing discovery, which Rule 56 says is generally improper uh, to grant summary judgment when requests for discovery are pending. And third, in considering the unverified exhibits. Um, Rule 56, as you'll recall, says very clearly, unsworn statements and unverified exhibits do not qualify as proper Rule 56 evidence. So if matters outside the pleading are gonna be considered on a motion to dismiss, you need to treat it as one under Rule 56 in all respects, in terms of the timing of responses, in terms of the exhibits to be considered, and in terms of the discovery to be allowed. So that's, the, uh, that's I think, the outcome of this case that provides guidance for us all in motion practice. With that, I'll turn it over to Brad. And uh, uh, bad timing as you hear dogs barking in the background. Um, I also wanted to extend my uh, congratulations to Judge Baker for his long service. And um, wanted to say that I can't wait to do this in person rather than looking at a computer screen while talking to all of you. But I am going to start my discussion today by talking about a case from the Indiana Supreme Court, uh, Bayer Corporation versus Leach. And as I say in the handout, 
this is a, this is not as much a lesson for us as, as something that we make sure the courts pay attention to so we don't have to waste a lot of time. Um, in this case, you had 36 women who made a mass product liability action claim against Bayer. Uh, Bayer moved for judgment on the pleadings saying that uh, the claims were precluded and preempted by federal law. Uh, trial court denied the motion that went up on appeal. And on appeal, the court of appeals looked through the various um, the various things that the hold on a second, I apologize. The trial court looked through the various things that the that claims that the uh, the, um, uh, the the plaintiffs brought, and and the court of appeals found one claim that it said um, was not precluded. It should survive the motion to dismiss. The court of appeals then said, "Well, since we found this one that claim that should survive, we're not going to address all the rest because uh, we have one that survives." And it went up on transfer. And basically, the court uh, on transfer said that, "No, no, 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 no." Well, we're a notice pleading statute, and you don't have to plead precise legal theories. When precise legal theories are pleaded, and you have a motion to dismiss that addresses those various theories, the fact that one theory survives doesn't mean that a court can uh, then not go ahead and rule on all the other ones. Uh, when you have a motion to dismiss addressing more than one claim, the courts need to address all the claims, not just find one that survives and leave everything else uh, going as well. So like I said, uh, a lot of time can be wasted if courts make that mistake, so let's help them not make it. Uh, the next case I'm gonna talk about is from the Indiana Court of Appeals. It's Freeman versus Timberland Home Center, Inc. And it addresses um, uh, preferred venue and uh, in an interesting context. Uh, in this case, you had a couple, the Nashes, who hired Clover Homes to build a home for them in Henderson County. Now, Clover Homes was, uh, and its owner, Freeman, resided in Putnam County. Um, it, Clover Homes opened up an account with Timberland to buy the building materials. Timberland was in Clay County. And there was another subcontractor brought on, which is located in Marion County. Well, the Nashes terminated their contract, and Clover Homes was unhappy with that, saying, we haven't been paid for everything. So um, the uh, they, uh, they filed a mechanics lien in their county. And uh, then they, where the home was being built. But then before anything else happened in Hendricks County, Clover Homes was sued by Timberland in Putnam County. Uh, and so then Clover Homes went and filed a third party complaint against the Nashes dealing with breach of contract the mechanics lien and defamation and did that in Putnam County. Now the Nashes moved to either dismiss the claim or transfer because there's a statute that says that if you're dealing with a mechanics lien, the claim has to be venued in the county where the mechanics lien is. And of course here it wasn't because the mechanics lien was in a, filed in a different county before this lawsuit was filed. Uh, and and the, the, court of appeal, the trial court agreed, it denied the motion to dismiss, but it did, did agree to transfer the case to Hendricks County and it went up on appeal. And, and on, on appeal, the court of appeals said, yes, um, uh, trial rule 75 is, it trumps statutes. And we have previously found though, that the statute dealing with the venue of mechanics lien is consistent with rule 75 and therefore enforceable. However, Rule 75 trumps in all things. And so even though that statute is consistent with Rule 75 in general, here you had this third party complaint that brings the case in. And under Rule 75, you know, wherever the preferred venue is when the case starts, if it's appropriate there, then it's appropriate for everything else that's brought into the case. So although the statute says that the case should have, that the mechanics lien case should have been in Hendricks County, and although the rule is on its face consistent with that, the application of the rule here meant that since the case was first brought in Putnam County, therefore the whole thing, including the mechanics lien, had to stay in Putnam County. Uh, I thought that was an interesting application of the rule uh, and uh, wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. And with that, I'll give it back to Ron. Okay, uh, we're back. 
And on case number five, for those of you who are following along, this is on page 10 of the handout. We're going to talk about Hall versus Shaw, a decision out of the Court of Appeals uh, written by Judge Friedlander. And it involves, well, it, it, our interest was um, prompted by the, uh, the treatment of malicious prosecution because the issue was whether a malicious prosecution claim can be brought for instigating a criminal prosecution, which seemed pretty obvious to me at the outset, but it's not at all obvious as explained by the court in this decision. Um, and it also addresses a number of other interesting issues that I think uh, you will find enlightening as well. The case arose when Melvin Hall uh, left his employment at the Central Indiana Protection Agency Incorporated, uh, or SEPA as I'll call it. Um, this is a security company. Melvin Hall left and he started a competing company. The owners of SEPA, uh, particularly a Mr. Shaw and a Mr. Narducci, were not happy about Mr. Hall leaving and competing with him. And they engaged in what is alleged, was alleged to be a coordinated campaign to defame Hall and drive him out of business. Hall then sued Shaw, Nardici, and Sipa for defamation, abuse of process, malicious prosecution, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. To get a flavor of what they based that on, you'll notice uh, on page 10 of our handout, a uh, a transcript of a voicemail which Mr. Narducci left to Mr. Hall after the uh, the lawsuit was filed. You will see he says, guess what dumb expletive you and your expletive probation license is going down the drain straight up. You suing me, I don't give an expletive. You know why? Because you engaged us into this expletive. You mother expletive are done for real, so when you play this expletive tape for your expletive lawyer, you let your lawyer know that this expletive ain't going to be easy. Remember that. If you think you mother expletive know who I am, who I am, you better go down to that City Cali building and keep checking mother expletive. I guess he was more than just a little unhappy. Um, uh, at any rate, so what happened after, well actually before this phone call, was that Mr. Nardici and Mr. Hall Shaw allegedly had uh, attempted to get charges filed against Hall for impersonating a police officer. And that was also the basis of the defamation claim. Um, so the question initially on malicious prosecution was, can you bring a malicious prosecution claim when the result is a criminal prosecution? The defendants argued here that that's not possible because the proximate cause of a criminal prosecution is the prosecutor and the police are making an investigation and making a decision. It can't be um, Mr. Shaw and Mr. Darducci or, or their company. It's got to be them as the proximate cause. And the court said, not on what the facts that we're seeing here. It alleges that, that, uh, that Mr. Shaw and Narducci had conspired with Alexander, Lola Martinez, and others to provide false testimony to try to incriminate Hall for impersonating a public service, servant, excuse me. If that claim is true, they said, that could constitute a proximate and efficient cause of Hall's prosecution. And therefore the dismissal of the malicious prosecution complaint that the trial court uh, had uh, uh, granted was in error. Uh, other claims were also dealt with, one of which was a defamation claim and an abusive process claim, both based on a complaint made by Mr. Darducci to the Attorney General's office, a consumer complaint. The Court held, the Court of Appeals held that such complaints are protected by absolute privilege applicable to judicial proceedings. I certainly wasn't aware that if you file a consumer complaint to the Attorney General's office, that would qualify as a quasi-judicial proceeding, and therefore whatever you file there would be subject to absolute privilege, but that's what the court holds. The court also briefly addresses the continuing wrong doctrine. That's the doctrine that essentially allows the deferral of the accrual of the statute of limitations if you are engaging in a continuing course of conduct. What the court made clear here was that it can only 
extend the statute of limitations, the running of it, if the course of conduct leads to a single injury. In this instance, each of the individual acts cause distinct injuries, and therefore that extension, as it applies to statute of limitations, would not apply. The court also clarified a little the, uh, the, the requirement that uh, defamation be alleged with some specificity. The, uh, there had been some case law that suggested it needed to be verbatim. The court says, no, it does not need to be verbatim, that it simply needs to be sufficiently specific to uh, give clear notice as to what the defamation was. And here, the communication that Hall had impersonated a police officer was sufficiently specific and clear. So that uh, if you're dealing with, with a defamation complaint and, um, and have concerns about it being verbatim or not, it doesn't need to be verbatim uh, according to this most recent decision. The other enlightening issue that was addressed in the case concerns civil conspiracy, which is something, frankly, I've, I've found confusing in the past, but I thought the court here addressed it in a fairly uh, uh, simple and clear way to say that, and the allegation arose in this context, uh, Hall had made a claim of civil conspiracy to bring Narducci and Shaw to make them liable for uh, defamation that was actually communicated by two other folks, this uh, Alexander and Lola Martinez. And they brought them in by asserting a civil conspiracy. And the court says, there's no separate cause of action for a civil conspiracy, but allegations of a civil conspiracy are another way of asserting a concerted action in the commission of a court, of a tort. In other words, it's a way of bringing Shaw and Narducci into liability for the tort of defamation when what they've done is directed to other people to commit the defamation. So that's the process um, by which that's done. And so I think I've addressed all of the things I've listed in the, in the lessons, except the last one, which is obvious, clients should be advised not to leave threatening voicemails like that of Mr. Narducci, because it can come back to haunt them as it did to him. Um, the next case deals with another doctrine, the contemporaneous document doctrine. <laughs> Historically, I've always understood as being simply a doctrine of contract interpretation or construction. In this case, they take it a little bit further. The case is the HLH Consulting LLC versus Bird Automotive Inc. And uh, it arose in this context. Uh, um, a Christine Bird Tanner um, inherited all the assets associated with the Bird Ford dealership on Pendleton Pike after her husband died. She wanted to sell those assets and she entered into two letter agreements with HLH Consulting, one an asset retention agreement for sale of the dealership assets and another a real estate retention agreement for sale or lease of the real estate used in the dealership's business. A sale was subsequently uh, consummated uh, initially with a buyer and then Ford had a right of first refusal and they stepped in. Uh, so the sale was made, a uh, commission was paid to HLH for the asset sale, and it was a real estate lease at $14.40 per month was the commission on the lease to HLH, which Christine paid for a few years, but then stopped. And after she stopped paying the commission, HLH, HLH sued, alleging breach of these retention agreements, and also alleging unjust enrichment. Um, the, the defense basically was that the agreement, the retention agreement for uh, sale or lease of the real estate violated public policy because HLH didn't have a, a real estate broker's license. And without a real estate broker's license, it's not entitled to any, any uh, commission. In fact, it's prohibited as a matter of law. But what does that do with the asset retention agreement? Well, the court said, well, the asset retention agreement and the real estate retention agreement were documents consummated on the same day for the same purpose with the same people. And we're gonna construe them together as a single contract. 
and the taint that applied to the real estate retention agreement extends to the asset retention agreement and therefore HLH is not entitled to any commissions and is required to pay back the commissions previously received. So that's, uh, that is the, I guess, the latest thing from the Indiana Appellate Courts on the contemporaneous document doctrine, applying it somewhat broadly, more broadly than you may have seen before. With that, I'll turn it back to Brad. The next case I'm going to discuss um, is, deals with CGL policy and cyber attacks that may happen to a business. And it's G&G Oil Company of Indiana versus Co uh, Continental Western Insurance Company. And, and Continental um, it issued a CGL to G&G that included what it termed commercial crime coverage. Um, they also offered to give a, a different form of coverage called computer virus and hacking coverage, but G&G chose not to purchase that particular kind of coverage. Now, uh, during the policy period, G&G was victimized by a ransomware attack where you get somebody in that uh, basically shuts down your ability to access your business and your computer uh, until you pay them a ransom. Uh, so G&G uh, ended up paying over $34,000 to unlock its systems and then submitted that claim to Continental under that commercial crime coverage. Thinking, well, you have a commercial crime here. Uh, Continental denied that claim for a couple of reasons. First, because it didn't purchase that computer virus and hacking coverage. And second, because the commercial crime coverage only covered losses resulting directly from the use of any computer to fraudulently cause a transfer from the business out of the business. And it said that, well, there's no fraudulent action here. So we're not going to, uh, we're not going to cover you. Well, uh, g, g wasn't happy that that sued. Uh, both parties move for summary judgment. Trial court grants it to Continental and it goes up on appeal. And so on appeal, G&G argues, well, ransomware attack, that's a form of computer fraud. And therefore we should be covered for that. And the court said, no, um, no, it's not. Because when you're talking about fraud, you're talking about um, intentional perversion of the truth in order to induce somebody to do something for you. And here, when you have somebody who hacks into your computer systems uh, and cuts off your ability to access things, well, they're not really perverting the truth and they're not deceiving you in any way. They're just doing something different than that. It's not fraud. And so uh, while there is, while the actions were illegal, there is no deception and therefore it's not covered by the computer crime coverage that G&D purchased. So uh, um, the, the big lesson there, I suppose, is if you yourself have computer crime coverage, you may want to check to see what's actually covered and you may want to spring for something that's broader for um, hacking more general rather than uh, a more limited set of that in case it happens to you. Uh, the next case uh, is from here in Indianapolis, uh, Davy Tree Expert versus City of Indianapolis. It deals with something similar, and this is indemnity. Um, you had Davy Tree in Indianapolis um, entered into a contract because here in Indianapolis, there's lots of trees that are close to right-of-ways and they need somebody to be able to go and inspect and maintain those trees. And so Indianapolis hired Davy Tree to do that. Um, and as part of the contract, Davy Tree agreed to indemnify the city for any claims that arise out of any neglect, negligent or wrongful act or omission or breach of any provision of this agreement by Davy Tree. Well, you had a, a gentleman named Stephen who was driving along a road in Indianapolis when a decomposing tree fell, hit his car and killed him. Um, and his estate filed a wrongful death claim against the city and Davy Tree. Now the city said, hey, Davy Tree, you agreed to identify us, so please do so. Davy Tree refused to do so. So as part of this claim, you had a cross claim between the two defendants, um, and then the city moved for a judgment on the pleadings, which the trial court granted. And so Davy Tree appealed, and we have an appeal on this issue of indemnification. And so on appeal, both parties agreed that Davy Tree was going to have to defend the city 
if the city was sued for Davy Tree's negligence. Uh, but uh, they disagreed over what that meant. And, and so the court, um, when deciding whether Davy Tree was, or whether the city was sued for Davy Tree's negligence, looked at the allegations in the complaint. And the allegations in the complaint, they didn't make any negligent hiring or supervision claim. Instead, they talked about the city's duties. The city had a duty for, to protect passersby. Um, the city had a duty to um, make sure that uh, uh, any dangerous trees are removed. And that was the, the way that the complaint was framed. And the court said, well, that framing means that this, we're not talking about Davy Tree's negligence here. It's talking about the city's independent negligence and independent neglect. Um, uh, and, and it's independent conduct. Now, Davy Tree said, well, no, no, no. We should, we should have this kind of um, indemnity apply, or the city argued that we should have this kind of indemnity apply if the allegations against both it and Davy Tree were inexplicably or inextricably intertwined. And the court said that's an interesting test, but we're not going to apply it. Um, because uh, when you have these kinds of indemnity contracts, um, even though if there's a close relationship between the claims, uh, you drew up that contract carefully for a reason, and we're going to apply that contract. So even though it's, it's very close and it's very similar, the claims against the two separate defendants, they're not the same. Now, in doing so, uh, I pointed out before, there wasn't a negligent hiring or supervision claim. And uh, the, the court did note in a footnote that if the plaintiffs had made that claim, then it very well may have been that Davy Tree would have had to indemnify the city. Didn't decide that for, for sure, but it did give us that indication for the future. So um, uh, I guess the le there's lessons here for both plaintiffs and defendants about how to draft things and what to pay attention to. Um, but uh, I think that if you're dealing with indemnity clauses, you definitely need to look at the language carefully, and then you also need to look carefully at the claims uh, because the court's going to draw strict lines there um, instead of being more loosey goosey, inextricably intertwined kind of test. Uh, the next case I'm going to talk about is one that there's been a lot of disagreement in the Court of Appeals on, and we may get some um, guidance from the Indiana Supreme Court in the near future. And it deals with something that a lot of us deal with a lot, which is the business records exception to the hearsay. Um, and in this case, you had a mother and a father who um, stole some stuff from a target uh, when, they're, uh, and, uh, when they were caught basically shortly after leaving the target. Target called again. They're pulled over. Um, Mom admitted stealing the things. The target stuff was in the back along with some syringes, a bent spoon, and a child in a car seat. And so DCS got involved uh, and a chintz petition was filed. Um, Father and mother during these proceedings agreed to submit to drug tests. Now the drug tests were processed by a lab of a Michigan called Forensic Fluids. And at the fact finding hearing for the Chins case, you had the lab director um, say that she didn't personally take the tests, but this is our procedure, this is our process, and this is the results of the tests of mother and father. Now, um, the father objected to that testimony um, and that, but it was allowed over his testimony. And afterwards, the trial court found that, that um, the child was a chins, relying in part on this testimony the father objected to. So the father appeals. Um, and last year, there was a decision from the Indiana Court of Appeals that held that lab reports from this same lab did not fall into the business records exception. And, and it did that because it found that, um, for, among other things, that um, the lab created these reports for DCS, not for its own operations. And so they didn't have the type of reliability that we would normally need for a business record. Uh, well, the court, he, this panel of the court disagreed with that other panel, noting uh, a couple of things. First, it said that, well, uh, the regulations governing these labs require that they keep these lab reports for two years in order to maintain their certification. So really, these reports are, um, uh, the, the, the operations of the lab are dependent on these reports. And, and second, 
that these reports have indicators of reliability separate and apart from their status as uh, business records because you know they're subject to review, audit, that kind of thing. And their precision is engendered by repetition. They do the same thing over and over. And so for those reasons, the courts said, we really do think these are business records and therefore uh, they, they were an exception to the hearsay rule. Um, so you have a clear conflict. Uh, interestingly enough, the court noted that yet a third case uh, of the Court of Appeals, uh, this one also from last year, had found that um, the, the uh, reports from the same lab in another DCS case were business records. And that case, uh, in that case, the Supreme Court granted transfer. Um, they had argument on that on May 21st. Um, I have not watched that argument to give you a report on it. But what I can say is, I think in the near future, Sure, we're going to have some clarification regarding the business records exception that I suspect will give us more gu guidance and more than just these kinds of lab reports and DCS cases. And uh, we should all keep an eye out for that. Ron? Our next case is one that involves a claim of spoliation. In fact, it involves conduct that the Court of Appeals called, quote, the apex of the spoliation culpability continuum, end quote. So if you want to know what the spoliation culpability continuum is and what's at the apex, listen in. It also resulted in an eight-figure uh, recovery for the plaintiff in this case. The, the case is Carmichael versus Separators, Inc. It's an opinion by Judge Riley uh, issued in May of this year. And the plaintiff in the case was Separators, Inc. Uh, Separators, Inc. is a centrifuge company and if you're like me and you haven't encountered much in the way of centrifuges recently, I did just look it up and it is a laboratory device that is used for the separation of fluids, gas or liquid based on density. And separation is achieved by spinning a vessel containing material at high speed. The centrifugal force pushes heavier materials to the outside of the vessel. So that's how it works. That's the business separators Inc. was in. It had an employee by the name of Carmichael, who was parts managers at Separators Inc. for a number of years, for eight years actually. And uh, Carmichael had an assistant named Monday. Um, they did not, neither of them signed any non-compete or non-solicitation or confidentiality agreement with Separators. But in early 2013, Mr. Carmichael decided that he would leave uh, Separators Inc. and start his own business called CSI as a direct competitor. Before he left, he copied hundreds of manuals from the technical library and subsequently copied those electronic files onto his CSI computer. Uh, a couple of years after Carmichael left, Monday, who had become the parts manager replacing Carmichael when he left, Monday decided to join Carmichael at his new business as the vice president. Uh, but before he left, Monday also copied thousands of data files relating to separators business, including the manual, sales documents, service parts list, customer quotes. And he downloaded all of this onto CSI's computers on the first day there. So when uh, uh, CSI was becoming a competitor now with separators, Separators sued. They sued CSI, they sued Carmichael and Monday for taking its confidential information and trade secrets. As I said, there was no non-compete or equivalent document, but they were, uh, they were claiming this was a, a, a taking of their confidential information and trade secrets, and they obtained promptly a TRO preventing the defendants from using that information. And they obtained an order Specifically, the defendants preserve electronic evidence. So what happened after the court issued this TRO and this order to preserve electronic evidence? The defendants were personally served at 6 p.m. Three minutes later, approximately 100 files related to separators were deleted from CSI's computers. And about a, an hour later, another 1,063 items related to separators were deleted. Uh, and then um, 
I said there was a TRO issued. A little bit later, a, a preliminary injunction was issued that was to be implemented on September 24th. Um, between, I guess the preliminary injunction may have been issued on September 22nd to be implemented on 24th with um, some sort of assistance. Uh, in the two days that uh, between those, before they were, uh, that happened, they deleted another 932 files and then they failed to give the devices requested to the separator's computer forensics expert. After this course of conduct, uh, not surprisingly, separators sought to have the defendants held in contempt and they requested a default judgment, which was in fact forthcoming after a hearing, uh, granting a default judgment on most of separators' claims and awarding attorney's fees. Uh, now, this was challenged by Mr. Carpenter in particular. I'm not sure whether CSI had much in the way of assets thereafter or Mr. Monday ever had much in, the way, much in the way of assets. But Carmichael was the one that first sought to get the trial court changed by moving for summary judgment. And apparently he had a pretty good uh, summary judgment argument. Part of his liability was based on uh, a, a civil conspiracy claim that like I talked to a moment ago, where he was attempting to be held liable for conduct of Mr. Monday or of the corporation. And there is no conspiracy within a corporation. That's one of the basic exceptions. But the courts basically said, no, nah, it's too late. The default judgment is entered. Your defense if you, is, uh, is not going to be helpful uh, in light of the, uh, the, the sanction here of a default judgment for wrongful conduct. There was a trial uh, to determine damages, finding a little over 8.6 million in compensatory damages and 3 million in exemplary damages. Carmichael appealed. Uh, he argued, among other things, that, well, you know, before you have sanctions of this severity, there ought to be some progressive sanctions. And that's when the court said, no, not when you have this egregious and demonstrated, uh, a demonstrating a flagrant disregard for the trial court's discovery orders. We don't need to have progressive sanctions that trial courts are permitted to exercise their contempt powers to promote orderly discovery and punish discovery violations so that others are not tempted to engage in like conduct. Um, and, and, and so among other things, the notion of a procedural attack by summary judgment motion or the like was not uh, to be allowed. And that's what the Court of Appeals determined. Obviously, this case is one that emphasizes the importance of preservation letters and preservation orders as tools of litigation, because certainly some people are going to not preserve them and destroy them when they uh, might be used against them. Um, obviously, in this case, as in others, simply the destruction of evidence after a preservation order will only make matters worse. And one other lesson is that just because you don't have a confidentiality agreement or not compete does not leave a business defenseless when its proprietary information is taken by a departing employee. So that's an important case on spoliation and protecting uh, a company's proprietary information. Uh, our next case is one also written, by the way, by Judge Riley, that uh, also arises in the corporate context. It's a context that involved the appraisal of um, or the valuation of shares of a minority shareholder. And it, uh, it's something that often arises in corporate divorces when those occur. I've encountered these a few times and frequently when that appraisal is made, there is a discount given with respect to uh, lack of control when a minority shareholders, when a minority shareholder shares are being valued. And likewise, there is a discount given reducing the value for lack of mar marketability when it's not a publicly traded uh, stock. So those two things, lack of marketability, lack of control, are common discounts given. And the issue that was presented to Judge Riley and the Indiana Court of Appeals in the case of Hartman versus Big Inch Fabricators, Fabricators and Construction Holding Company was whether those should have been applied in this case where there was the shareholder agreement, which called for a 
the determination of, quote, the appraised market value. Um, specifically, it arose in this context. Um, you have a group of shareholders, 10 shareholders in a company, the Big Inch Company. One of the shareholders and the co-founder is a Mr. Hartman. The, uh, the company decides to terminate Mr. Hartman. Under the shareholder agreement, he, the company is then required to buy back his shares at the appraised value on the last day of the year preceding the valuation, determined in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles by a third party valuation company." End quote. So the company hired a Mr. Wanch to appraise Mr. Hartman's share. He said the value of the shares was a little over 3.5 million, but he said it needed to be discount, discounted for lack of control and for non-marketability. And so uh, after he applied those discounts, the, the value was reduced by about a third or uh, about 2.4 million instead of 3.5 million. Mr. Hartman disagreed with that and um, went to court, asking the trial court to, uh, to agree that it should be the higher number, not the lower number. But the company moved for summary judgment and the trial court granted it in Mr. Hartman that appeal. And the Court of Appeals, when they looked at it, they saw it a little differently than the trial court. They saw it in part because they looked at a case called Wenzel versus Hopper and Gallagher, um, decided in 2002, which addressed a similar issue under the Indiana Professional Corporation Act. And in that case, the court found the value of a minority shareholder share should not be discounted for lack of control or lack of marketability. Um, and the court said, we don't see any reason why that holding should not apply here where you've got a compulsory buyback pursuant to a shareholder agreement that neither of these in these circumstances warrant a, uh, uh, a discounting. With that, I'll turn it back to Brad. Next case I'm gonna discuss is Furby versus Wilson. Um, and it discusses the various um, uh, measures for discrimination, in particular in, in housing discrimination um, between landlords and tenants. Um, and, and in this case, you had a woman named Linda who wanted to uh, rent an apartment from Furby. She rented the apartment about six months into the lease. Um, she'd been seeing a therapist and took a letter from the therapist to Furby, which uh, said that she needed to have a cat as an, emo as an emotional support animal. Well. Furby asked Linder for additional information so that Furby could determine what kind of accommodation was necessary because there is a no pet policy in the apartment. Um, and uh, so this request asked for a lot of information, including about the nature of the disability and, and other detailed information like that. Linda refused to provide the information, but took the cat in the apartment anyway and was eventually evicted. And the Indiana Civil Rights Commission filed a complaint on Linder's behalf, alleging unlawful discrimination um, against Furby. Uh, Furby moved for summary judgment, arguing that, hey, I asked for this information, I'm entitled to it, so uh, I, I can't be blamed for discriminating. And the trial court said, yes, uh, Furby did need additional information, but you asked for too much. And so therefore, I'm going to deny the motion for summary judgment and Furby appealed. And so the court said um, the, you have the Indiana Fair Housing Act, which mirrors the federal Fair Housing Act. And, um, and we talk about discrimination in this context, context, you need to have an opportunity for reasonable accommodations. Uh, but that means when somebody who's disabled is asking for that accommodation, they have to give um, the, the other person they're dealing with a chance for meaningfully reviewing the request. And what they said is that that means that um, the, the person who's claiming discrimination must have given the other side the information necessary to one, apprise them of the disability and the desire and possible need for an accommodation. Um, and you have to give that information. And we look here, the letter um, told Furby that Linder meets the definition of the disability, but didn't identify what the disability was. 
And it further said that Linder has certain limitations with coping um, that stem from the disability that need to be accommodated, but it didn't identify the limitations or symptoms of the disability. Um, and so what the court said is that, yes, Furby may have requested additional information that was over and above that, um, but that, that information was a legitimate amount of information to request. Um, Furby, I mean, Linder said that, well, but they asked for too much, so I didn't have to provide that. And the court said, yeah, you didn't have to provide the extra stuff, but the very minimum, you had to provide what they were legitimately entitled to. And since the, the tenant here was the one who had the breakdown in the communications, the tenant is the one who loses when there's not enough communication. And, and therefore, uh, if the tenant did nothing, uh, the, the landlord can't be blamed, and therefore, the landlord didn't unlawfully discriminate against the tenant for not approving the um, the cat as a as a as an emotional support animal. Uh, in the next case, um, Community Health Network Inc. versus McKenzie, um, it's an it's an interesting case, and it deals with um, uh, unauthorized access to confidential medical records and what kinds of claims can arise out of it. Um, in this situation, you had two women, Katrina and Heather, who worked together for about five years in which Katrina was Heather's boss. Um, and at some time, Katrina said, introduced Heather to her stepson. The two started dating, the two got married, they had a couple kids, and then they had a divorce. Um, divorce it was pretty acrimonious. Heather had custody, but there's a lot of acrimony there. Well, um, Katrina and Heather, you know, separated ways after a while. And they stopped working together, and Katrina um, uh, got hired by Community as a medical records coordinator. And they trained. She had training on patient confidentiality and HIPAA, and was uh, had all this training on how to maintain patient confidentiality. But she didn't follow those rules. Uh, and instead, she just looked up medical records of uh, patients like Heather and Heather's family. Um, and then uh, on multiple occasions, for months, she was looking up their medical records to track what was going on with them. Uh, she did this on the job from community computers. Um, community eventually found out about this on, uh, and informed the patients that this had taken place, uh, terminated Katrina. But then the plaintiffs filed a suit against community saying that uh, community was responsible for Katrina's unauthorized access to these computer records. Now, community moved to dismiss for a variety of reasons, or, uh, well, they moved to, they moved to get rid of the suit for a variety of reasons. They moved to dismiss, claiming that this was a medical malpractice claim, and that they didn't, and the plaintiffs didn't follow the uh, medical malpractice act and go to the medical review panel. And they also moved for summary judgment, saying there's no vicarious liability, there's no duty, there's no breach and there's no damages. Um, trial court denied both motions. They went up and on appeal, the court addressed that motion to dismiss about medical malpractice first. Um, and, and, and when doing it, it looked at the definition of medical malpractice and in the handout, there's uh, on page 24, uh, the, the italicizing was that in the quote about the, uh, that the court found important is that of the court, not of us presenting, presenting the handout. Um, when it says that medical malpractice must be based on healthcare or professional services that were provided. And in this case, uh, the court said that um, the, the claims here against community um, are for negligent training, supervision and retention. And they are demonstrably unrelated to the promotion of the health of the plaintiffs or an exercise of professional skill, expertise, or judgment. So these kinds of claims about unauthorized access uh, are actually not covered by the Medical Malpractice Act. And therefore, the plaintiffs in these kinds of cases don't need to go through the uh, review panel process in order to bring their claims. Now, if we move to the summary judgment motion, the first issue that I mentioned um, was whether they were, there was any respondeat superior here. Now, interestingly, there had been an earlier case in which a similar kind of unauthorized access claim was made. Um, but in that case, when it came to summary judgment, the defendants had an affidavit of the employee who admitted 
was used and this is at, at, at the unauthorized access to the records. And that employee in the affidavit said, yes, yes, I did this for my own uh, personal reasons. And I was acting on my no, own initiative and I was not within the scope of my employment. Well, in that case, the court said, well, then they're outside of the scope of their employment. I guess we're done here um, the, and, and, and affirmed a summary judgment. The court here said, well, we don't have that kind of evidence. We don't have an affidavit from Katrina. Instead, what we have is evidence that Katrina's actions are the same general nature of those authorized or that they were incidental to the actions that she was, all, was already authorized to do by community. And under that set of circumstances, we have a genuine issue of material fact here. And therefore, uh, the, the community is not entitled to summary judgment um, on the respondeat superior claim. Now, community next argued, well, if you look at in Indiana and the federal government all have statutes protecting the confidentiality of patient information. Uh, and, and neither the Indiana statute nor the federal statutes uh, create a private right of action. So community said, well, we have no duty to keep this stuff confidential. And the court strongly disagreed. It said that there is and always has been a common law duty of confidentiality that medical providers owe their patients. And that duty of confidentiality extends to the medical records and therefore unauthorized access to medical records is a breach of that duty. So even though there are these statutes and there's this statutory structure surrounding um, uh, patient confidentiality, um, they don't create a private right of action, but the common law does. Uh, and, and the community said, well, we, even if there was a duty, we didn't breach it because we trained Katrina. We did everything we could with regards to Katrina. And therefore, we can't be blamed because she ignored her training. Um, and the court said, well, it's not enough for community to point to its training as education, to, to wipe its hands and say that we're not at fault for Katrina's access to the health information um, that in general. And I think it wasn't helped that Katrina had accessed that health information for nine months without community ever noticing it or having, uh, having any kind of systems in place to prevent that kind of repeated unauthorized access to the health information. Um, the court didn't say that, but I suspect that was a contributing factor. Uh, and then on the lack of damages thing, uh, this is, I think, was important to highlight for all of us for ending on a summary judgment procedure. Um, we all know that in federal court, um, the summary judgment is different than in state court, and and but community seems to have forgotten that when making their motion because they argued that the that the there's no damages because the plaintiffs have failed to proffer any evidence of any injury as a result of this unauthorized access, and the court said no, that's not the right standard here. You must affirmatively negate the opponent's claim, and in this context, you must affirmatively prove that they had no damages. You didn't do that. You can't just say they haven't offered the proof. You have to affirmatively prove it yourself. Um, community did win one small issue though. Uh, one of the plaintiff's claims was for invasion of privacy because they said um, that you know, we have this public disclosure of our private health facts. And the court said, well, while invasion of privacy is a claim here in Indiana, the courts have consistently refused to extend that to this particular kind of claim, which would be that public disclosure of private facts, um, that we're not gonna do that in this case, and therefore that particular claim didn't survive in this context. Um, the next case is one that touches on an issue that Ron mentioned earlier, um, in another case, which deals with absolute privilege. Um, and it's Abbott versus Individual Support Home Health Agency, Inc. And home health is one of these home-based healthcare services, and it's regulated by the, the Indiana State Department of Health. And it had um, some nurses that were working for it. The nurses, um, they, all, they uh, filed reports to the Department of Health saying that uh, employees had forged their signatures on documents related to patient health. Now, home health said, you know, those are false reports, and they're just re retaliating because we gave them poor performance reviews. Um, the Department of Health, it, it, it did its investigation, it found the reports were not substantiated, and, and that part of the proceeding was done. But Home Health was unhappy with these nurses, and it filed a suit against them. 
Uh, the nurses moved to dismiss, saying that their reports were absolutely privileged. Uh, the trial court denied that motion and went up on appeal. And the court said that, you know, this absolute privilege uh, that protects relevant statements in the course of judicial proceedings, uh, that the Indiana's courts used to um, narrowly construe that to judicial proceedings. But in 2008, the Indiana Supreme Court expanded it to a situation in which students at Purdue had complained about uh, a professor um, uh, making, uh, doing uh, sexual harassment types of things. And it said that uh, that was a quasi-judicial proceeding and that the absolute immunity extended to that quasi-judicial um, uh, issue. Now here, uh, Home Health said, yeah, but there's also a different kind of immunity when you're dealing with these kinds of defamation claims. Um, like uh, there's a qualified immunity for when you're reporting criminal activity to law enforcement. And Home Health said that's essentially what's going on here is you have this report of unlawful activity to the regulating agency. And therefore that qualified immunity should be applied, which means that there still could be liability in some cases. Uh, and the, the court said, um, if we look at the, the, the students reporting, uh, the university professor, and when you look at, at the qualified immunity with report of criminal activity, we think it's closer to the first rather than the second. And when it, when it made that decision, it talked about um, the fact that there are substantial deterrents to false reporting in this particular kind of context. It noted that um, these licensed nurses were uh, expressly prohibited from engaging in uh, fraudulent behavior in the, in the course of their employment. There were sanctions that could be imposed um, that would have effects on their uh, employability in the future if they're found to have, be doing false reporting. And that uh, the employer here is in a position of power. And that's different, they said, than in cases where somebody's reporting criminal activity. And so uh, I know Ron expressed surprise about um, one form of whistleblow rep whistleblowing reporting being a quasi-judicial proceeding. Um, but it looks like these are the kinds of facts the courts are looking at to determine whether um, a proceeding that's been instituted is um, quasi-judicial or something else. And so if you're dealing with this, I think this is going to be one of those cases that's going to help you determine whether you can apply the absolute immunity to a particular set of facts or not. Ron? Our next case is one that deals with the, uh, the affirmative defense of failure to mitigate. And it's an important new decision by the Court of Appeals in Harris versus Jones, with a decision uh, written by Judge Crone. And it arose in this context. There was a soft tissue back injury following a rear end collision the plaintiff, uh, a lady named Harris, was referred for an MRI by her treating physician, but became claustrophobic and did not complete it. This failure apparently became the basis for the defendant's failure to mitigate defense. Over plaintiff's objection, the trial court gave a failure to mitigate instruction. And that was the issue addressed by the Court of Appeals after plaintiff lost her medical malpractice claim, got a defense verdict, claimed on appeal that it should be reversed because the trial judge should never have given this failure to mitigate instruction. And Judge Crone looks at the case and he looks at, among other things, the elements of a failure to mitigate defense. And he says, first, the defendant must prove that the plaintiff failed to exercise reasonable care to mitigate his or her post-injury damages. And then he says, next, the defendant must prove that the plaintiff's failure to exercise reasonable care caused the plaintiff to suffer an identifiable item of harm not attributable to the defendant's negligent conduct. And he, extend, he then adds, it's not enough to establish that the plaintiff acted unreasonably. The defendant must establish resulting, identifiable, quantifiable additional injury. And then notes, that when it comes to subjective injury like the plaintiff's here, we've held that the plaintiff is required to produce expert medical testimony to provide, to prove causation. And the court says, essentially, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. 
That same principle applies if the defendant wants to assert a failure to mitigate as a defense in this kind of, with respect to this kind of a claim. The defense must produce expert medical evidence. Here, there's no such expert medical evidence. In fact, there's no evidence that it says even a scintilla of evidence that this behavior and not proceeding with the MRI resulted in identifiable, quantifiable additional injury. And the failure to give the instruction required reversal of the decision and it was returned for a new trial. Um, and, and the reason why she appealed was the verdict was for $10,000, which was bad enough, given that she was making a claim for much more, but also because she had rejected a pretrial settlement offer of 25,000, she had to pay attorney's fees. But all of that got set aside because of the issuance of this failure to mitigate instruction, whether it had any impact on the result. Um, maybe we'll find out after a retrial. Uh, we turn next back to the Indiana Supreme Court in a very interesting decision by Judge Justice David in Clark versus Matar. And it involves essentially the problem of the reluctant juror. This was a juror who in response to uh, uh, questionnaires indicated clearly he did not want to serve as a jury, as a juror. When he got uh, um, in, uh, in the, the trial, he indicated several times that he didn't want to serve. He specifically though said that he didn't think he should have to or would be able to put a dollar amount to non-economic damages. And so that was an issue that, the, uh, that got raised on appeal um, because again, this was a case, uh, a medical malpractice case where the, uh, the, the case was lost the first time around. So the issue on appeal was, should Mr. Miller have been stricken um, on a motion for cause? In fact, a peremptory challenge was made that so he was removed from the panel, but the issue was, should he have been stricken for cause? And the trial judge basically said, he didn't want to serve anybody. I don't think he's biased one way or the other, and I'm not going to strike him for cause. So the peremptory was exercised. The, uh, the, the plaintiff then argued uh, that, uh, that that was on appeal, that that was a reversible error. And the court said, you know, given this statement that uh, it, he emphasized that he could not render a decision about non-economic damages, that constitutes bias, that constitutes cause, it should have been granted. Now, the court talks a lot about rehabilitation. There was no successful rehabilitation of him on that issue. If there had been, a different outcome would have been expected, but there wasn't. And then the issue became, well, is there prejudice here? Because he obviously is eliminated uh, by the peremptory challenge. And the court takes a different view than in federal court. In federal court, if you exercise your peremptory, that basically resolves the issue. In state court, if you exercise the perimeter under this rule, you can still claim prejudice. And in fact, the court says it's a bright line prejudice, assuming that you do everything that's required, that you make a proper challenge for cause, that you then strike the jury with your peremptory challenge, that you exhaust your peremptories, and that you identify on the record another juror as objectionable and for whom you would have used a peremptory if one had been available. And obviously, if you're opposing in this situation, you want to rehabilitate that juror if you can. Back to you, Brad. Next case I'm going to talk about is Burdick versus Romano. And um, uh, talk about dangerous animals. Uh, you had a woman named Romano who owns a horse farm where she boards and trains horses owned by the people. She has a pasture on the farm, and an indoor arena where horses can go and, and you can practice tricks and things like that. Um, and, and one thing that she has in the farm is this horse of hers named Shiza. That was an aggressive horse known for kicking other horses. Um, Burdick owned a horse named Chip that she kept boarded and trained at Romano's farm. Um, and she knew that, that Shiza could be aggressive. In fact, um, one time she went out riding horses with Romano in a pasture and 
was rewarned to keep her horse Chip away from Shiza because she'd back up and kick other horses. Well, just a few days after that, Burdick went to uh, ride her horse Chip in the arena, and she and Romano were riding horses together. And at one point, Romano got off of Shiza and walked away to go get a barrel to work on some kind of trick. Um, well, Burdick was behind Shiza uh, on on his horse on her horse Chip when Romano dismounted, and then Shiza came back, kicked Burdick, and seriously injured her. Now, Burdick sued Romano, and Romano moved for summary judgment. Uh, talk, and there's a and basically the the fundamental dispute came down to um, what standard of proof was Burdick going to have to meet in order to um, prove liability. Um, was she going to have to show that Romano's behavior was negligent or reckless? Well, the trial court sided with Romano on this situation and gave uh, a reckless instruction, and the jury turned a defense verdict and Burdick appealed. And so on appeal, the court noted that when you're talking about dog bite cases, dangerous dogs, you have negligence standard. Um, that's what um, that's what Burdick compared this to. But Romano compared this to sporting activities like golf or uh, practicing karate or, or mountain biking on a trail. And so that's really what this horse riding was more similar to. And that requires recklessness on the behalf of the defendant. Uh, the court said there's no bright line rule that there, it's going to create in these kinds of cases. But in this case, when you look at the facts, you had the two of them who were riding horses in a horse arena rather than out on the countryside. Um, that this arena was designed for training horses, that they described their activities as doing different kinds of tricks and training related to the sport of horseback riding. And so given those facts, um, that means that this is not a simple dog bite case. No, this is a, a sporting activity case. And therefore, the trial court correctly um, uh, gave the reckless instruction. Um, and I think that um, uh, this, is a, this is an interesting case for those of us who might have dangerous animal cases in the future. Uh, I can easily see defendants are going to try to expand what's a sporting activity when it comes to animals, and that plaintiffs are going to try to contract that. Uh, and this is going to be a, a, a case to talk about. Uh, the next case is one that deals with raised judicata. And it's Bremner versus Bins. And in this case, uh, basically, you had a, a dispute over an easement uh, between the, the Binses and the Brinmers. And um, the, the Binses filed suit uh, alleging a bunch of stuff, including that the um, easement between them was unenforceable. And the Brinmers counterclaimed, saying that, you know, we were able to landscape on this easement, you damaged the landscaping, you have to pay us money. During the lawsuit, the Binzes um, must have reached some kind of settlement because they, the, a joint stipulation was filed to dismiss the Binzes, the Binzes case uh, claims with prejudice, but it expressly did not dismiss the uh, Brinmers counterclaim. Well, Brinmers argued, hey, this dismissal is raised judicata, and therefore I win. Um, the trial court uh, disagreed and it actually eventually granted summary judgment to the Binzes finding that the easement was in fact unenforceable and went up on appeal. On appeal the court looked at the situation and said well, we have two kinds of preclusion we have raised judicata, claim preclusion and issue preclusion. For claim preclusion you need a final judgment on the merits and in this case you have more than one claim um, and only some of them got dismissed which means that to have a final judgment you need to have Rule 54B's magic language, and here you didn't have anything saying no just reason for delay, so there's no final judgment, so no claim preclusion. Now, on issue preclusion, you need something, uh, you need that to be on matters that are actually litigated and decided, and here you didn't have that. You had a dismissal uh, by stipulation, so there's nothing actually litigated and decided, so there's no preclusion. So uh, uh, the Binmers may have thought they're getting away with something, but they were wrong. Um, finally, uh, I, uh, the last case I have to discuss is one that deals with um, a Rule 60B practice. Uh, in this case, you have uh, a car accident, and the plaintiff sued the defendant, and five months later, uh, after service, when there had been no appearance or anything from the defendant, and one of the defendant's adjusters called 
plaintiff's counsel to confirm who confirmed yes suit's been filed here's a copy of the complaint crash report and proof of service Heard from nothing two weeks later moves for summary judgment and then at this point right before the hearing on damages the defendant says hold on let's move for 60 b says that you know um, after the adjuster spoke with counsel's office, he told the counsel about it. The counsel was on vacation. And, you know, when they moved for default judgment, they didn't tell us that to the adjuster. So we had no idea this was an issue. And then they attached an affidavit that was described in notorious defense, but the affidavit did not describe the facts that I just described to you about um, what the counsel said about these communications. The trial court denied, uh, granted the 60B motion, but the court of appeals that that was wrong. Because in the 60B motion, that affidavit not only needs to set forth the meritorious defense, but it had to set forth the factual basis for, in this case, why there was excusable neglect. And since you can't rely on argument alone to, uh, to establish those facts, you need to have those facts in an affidavit. And since uh, they didn't have that excusable neglect facts in an affidavit, they did not meet the burden of proof they needed to get the 60B in the first place. And therefore, uh, it, was, it was error for the trial court to grant it. It was to go back down for the default uh, damages hearing. Ron? Uh, our next case uh, comes from the Court of Appeals. Again, a decision by Judge Najem that involves the question of allegations of violations of the rules of professional conduct and how that affects legal malpractice. In the trial court, there was a pro se complaint by a client against his lawyer, alleging a variety of things, including mentioning violating the rules of professional conduct. The trial court granted the motion, based, uh, the lawyer filed a motion to dismiss saying, you can't uh, base a claim for violation of rules of, of professional conduct. And the trial court granted the motion dismissing the complaint in full. What the court in a very short opinion basically says is, the assertion of a violation of the rules of professional malpractice does not protect you against a legal malpractice claim. It may not prove the claim. In fact, the, the rules specifically say they don't give rise to a cause of action and doesn't create a presumption of a legal duty being breached, but it doesn't provide a protection if there has in fact been legal malpractice and the, case should, the, the complaint should not have been dismissed. Our last case is one that I find really interesting by Chief Justice Rush. Um, it's entitled River Ridge Development Authority versus Outfront Media, LLC. And it addresses essentially what are the boundaries for zealous advocacy and provides a pretty clear description of the different ways that that is now controlled under the law. And, and without getting into the details of the case since, it's, since we're running late, let me just go to the way the court framed the analysis of whether the conduct of the plaintiff, which was asserted by defendants to be improper. The plaintiff had sued seven different defendants on theories that they said were meritless and ultimately dismissed uh, the, the case after a significant expense. The trial court thought the conduct of the plaintiff was improper and awarded, uh, awarded damages. Court of, uh, the Supreme Court, when it got to it said, looked at it in very closely, looked at it by considering first what it calls the obdurate behavior exception. This is uh, basically the common law rule that was first established in, in um, uh, Indiana in 1973. When I say an exception, it's ex an exception to the American rule that, if, that you pay for your own attorney. There's no fee shifting in the ordinary course. There is an exception if one of the parties engages in obdurate behavior, but the requirements to recover in that instance is, is first that you must be a prevailing party. If you are a prevailing party and the loser has knowingly filed or failed to dismiss a baseless claim and a trial court finds the conduct vexatious and oppressive in the extreme and a blatant abuse of the judicial process, then you've got a claim for attorney's fees under this obdurate behavior exception. Now that exception was largely qualified by what the Supreme Court calls the general recovery rule in 1986 that again authorizes fee shifting only for a prevailing party 
if an action or defense is frivolous, unreasonable, or groundless, or is litigated in bad faith. So you've got the statute to look to if you're trying to shift attorney's fees against a losing party who you think has engaged in bad faith, baseless claims, frivolous claims, that statute is available, as well as the common law rule under the obdurate behavior exception. There is further authority, what the court refers to as inherent authority, that a court may sanction a party by shifting fees if a party has acted in bad faith and its conduct was calculatedly oppressive, obdurate, or obstreperous. That th those are the words. Uh, if, if you think the conduct fits any of those categories, you can seek a sanction under the court's inherent authority. The court looked at the conduct of the plaintiffs and the plaintiff's counsel in this case, and, they are, and, and basically looked closely at them and said, none of it seems to rise to the standards of those in, as to the, uh, the prevailing party requirement for both the obdurate behavior exception and the general recovery rule, the court said that wasn't satisfied here. You might think a dismissal with prejudice would make you the, the prevailing party as the defendant, but it doesn't. A prevailing party is one who gets a favorable judgment. A dismissal with prejudice doesn't. And that slightly overstates it, by the way. There was, uh, the, the, the lawsuit was initiated to try to prevent some billboards from being built. And the dismissal occurred after three were built, but the other were excluded for other reasons because uh, of some other administrative action. But you don't, you're not a prevailing party, which you might have thought if there is simply a dismissal with prejudice and you are, you've got some very high, high bar to pass to get fees shifted uh, as the, under the exception to the American rule or under the statute from 1986. So that's the cases for the month. Let me just end with my usual tip of the month. And let me just suggest since our time has come to an end that you simply read the advocacy tip, which is the, uh, the, the suggestion from Brian Garner that you see yourself as an editor in the written work that you present and make your work more interesting and less dull by among other things, eliminating verbosity and redundancy and he has other specific suggestions. So I recommend it to you. And with that, I think we're done for the day. Uh, thank you all for sticking through this. I see we've still got 90 participants online, which that is impressive in my mind. Brad and I, I believe we'll be back to see you in October. And until then, I hope everybody has a good summer. I just wanted to remind everybody to send me their CLE um, certificates too. Thank you.